Today we're going to talk about the Civil War in the West in 1862, the Union offensives, the grand design, and the experiences of some boys from the state of Wisconsin. This is Ryan and welcome to Footnoting History. On January 19, 1862, 19-year-old Ebenezer Westcott arrived in Madison, Wisconsin with his company, the Corcoran Guards, where he and his best friend Sam McClement, a jolly, big-hearted Irish boy, meant to join the ranks of the 17th Wisconsin. On the day of his enlistment, the young soldier proudly wrote home that he and his comrades went to the Capitol and were mustered into service of the United States, drew our uniforms, and became full-fledged volunteer soldiers of Uncle Sam. Signing the rolls, Westcott and McClement joined hundreds of thousands of other young men in defense of the Union. Three months later, on St. Patrick's Day, the regiment mutinied over issues of pay. Simply put, the citizen soldiers did not want to leave the state until they had been paid. Their families were suffering, and many soldiers were reluctant to leave for the battlefield. When finally compelled at the point of bayonet to board trains, the men from Wisconsin would become part of a major Western offensive in 1862, a grand move by Union armies that ultimately breached the Confederate frontier and contributed significantly to the ultimate defeat of the rebellious South. For the men of the 17th Wisconsin, the journey south was a welcome distraction from the re recent protests over pay. Arriving in St. Louis at Camp Benton on March 24th, a soldier from the 17th wrote to his local newspaper to express the present surprise at the welcome the troops have received there. Crossing over from East St. Louis, the men of the 17th debarked their uh, steamer and took up a five-mile march to camp. Over this route, quite a gratifying Union demonstrations from the ladies flanked both sides, the unnamed soldier wrote, which made me think about the hard stories of Southern ladies being such dreadful rebels was what might be termed an unqualified humbug. It was all I could do, he continued, to keep some of the good-looking girls I passed from kissing me. Ever cautious... And perhaps with stories of Southern misdeeds still lingering in the back of his mind, the soldier refused advances, fearing that some might have concealed poison on their lips and he would be picked up a lifeless but beautiful corpse. The regiment left St. Louis on March 26th aboard the steamer Imperial bound for Pittsburgh Landing. They arrived as the Battle of Shiloh was reaching its final conclusion. The scene that greeted them was truly awful and sublime, recalled one soldier. The landing on the Tennessee River was... Surrounded by barren cliffs and inaccessible rocks, separated occasionally by ravines. Along the landing for miles, nothing presents itself but an increasing coming and goings of steamboats. Disembarking, the men were moved to a vast city of canvas, eight miles long and four miles across, where they sat to await Ulysses S. Grant's next move. Private Ebenezer Westcott wrote to his mother that it begins to look more like business than it did when we were in camp up north. Although the excitement of Pittsburgh Landing was a welcome relief from the monotony of camp life, the young private looked upon the upcoming campaign with trepidation. Sometimes I wish I was up north now instead of here, he wrote home, but here I am and here I will stay, I suppose. The anxiety he showed was likely compounded as the news of Shiloh, amidst all its horrors, carnage, and desolation, spread among the re regiments encamped at Pittsburgh Landing. The fight at Shiloh was the first major battle in the West in 1862. Ulysses S. Grant commanded a sizable Union force at Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee River, but the Union Army was itself divided. In the winter of 1861 and 1862, Grant, the son of a tanner and a West Pointer, who had struggled immensely in the years before the war, had risen to prominence during his lightning campaigns against Fort Henry and Donelson, capturing over 12,000 Confederates and securing Union control of the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. After the fall of Fort Donelson, Grant ordered Union forces to advance on Nashville, which they took on February 25th. This was the first Confederate capital to fall to advancing Union forces. And as Union soldiers occupied Nashville, Confederates retreated south into Alabama. They would never truly threaten the volunteer state again. Grant's stunning success caused tension with his superior, General Henry Halleck, who thought his subordinate took excessive risks and he threatened Grant with arrests on numerous occasions. Nevertheless, unconditional surrender Grant, as he became known in, in the press, was a rising star and was the first Union commander to truly understand the new nature of warfare in the South. Leaving Nashville in the capable hands of General Don Carlos Buell, Grant began moving his forces south down the Tennessee River, massing them 
at Pittsburgh Landing. As he moved south, he commanded a force of over 120 boats and nearly 40,000 men. His foe was General Albert Sidney Johnson, who, after the fall of Forts Henry and Donelson, had moved to concentrate the Southern forces in the West into one grand army. Up to this point, Confederate forces had been spread throughout the region in a weak defensive position, and Johnson's goal was somewhat simple and very desperate. With 42,000 men consolidated at Corinth, Mississippi, he slightly outnumbered Grant's army, and he hoped to strike the Union forces at Pittsburgh Landing before Don Carlos Buell could arrive from Nashville with an additional 35,000 troops. Johnson hoped to crush Grant's army against the banks of the Tennessee River, where there was no chance for retreat. The Confederates were raw. Few had seen combat, and fewer still had ever experienced a sustained march. Nevertheless, Johnson began his move from Corinth on the morning of April 4th, hoping to cover the 20 miles to Pittsburgh Landing by evening. Confusion and delay wreaked havoc upon the Confederates, who were unable to consolidate their forces opposite Grant's line until the evening of April 5th, at which point few were certain they still commanded the element of surprise, and unsure if Buell had arrived to reinforce Grant's army. Nevertheless, Johnson vowed to fight. I would fight them if he, they had a million, Johnson said, as he orders his men to prepare for battle. Gentlemen, we shall attack at daylight tomorrow. On the morning of April 6th, Johnson moved forward and his screaming force descended upon Grant's line in a fury. He caught his foe off guard. Grant had not bothered to order his men to build fortifications around Pittsburgh Landing, for he did not believe that he would be attacked. And over the course of that morning, the Confederates slowly pushed the Federal Army back to a line along the banks of the Tennessee River. Federal units put up a staunch defense, so casualties were heavy on both sides. But as the morning turned into afternoon, the wave of Confederates began to crest upon stiff Union resistance. Johnson, fearing the loss of momentum and with victory in hand, rode to the front to rally his men. There he was wounded in the leg, the ball severing an artery. He did not realize the severity of his injury until blood filled his boot, and by then it was too late. The Confederate commander, the rebel's true hope in the West, fell dead upon the battlefield. Command of the Army transferred to PGT Beauregard, a flamboyant Cajun and hero of Fort Sumner and Bull Run. The Louisianan tried to continue the momentum, but the Confederate attack had become disorganized. Focus fell upon the Union position at the Hornet's Nest, while some 4,500 troops under General Benjamin Prentiss commanded a strong defensive position along a sunken road. Grant ordered Prentiss to maintain the position at all hazards, and the general did repelling some 12 assaults by more than 18,000 Confederates before finally surrendering his position at 5.30 p.m., Prentiss had given Grant time he needed. As night descended on the battlefield, Buell and his fresh force of some 25,000 men began to cross the river and take position for the morning assault. Grant knew his advantage. When an officer asked whether the commander would withdraw before the morning, the wiry Union general rep replied, retreat. No, I propose to attack at daylight and whip them. Unaware of the Union reinforcements, Beauregard conceived a morning assault as well. We will be whipped like hell, Cavalry Commander Nathaniel Bedford Forrest responded when he heard news of the re renewed attack. At dawn, the Union took offensive and did not relinquish it again. Beaten, the Confederates withdrew from a field that over the course of two days had cost both armies nearly 10,000 men. It was the bloodiest battle of the war thus far, but the rebel, rebel army was still intact and the West still staunchly loyal to their new nation. So for the Union, there was work left to be done. Although the 17th Wisconsin had avoided the slaughter at Shiloh, the next few months wore heavily on the men from the Badger State. Halleck assumed command from Grant and consolidated the army at Pittsburgh Landing. Poised to move south, he could bring some 130,000 men to the field. Thus, the Union forces turned their attention to the rail hub at Corinth, 20 miles south, where Beauregard and the remains of the Army of the Mississippi had retreated and linked forces with General Earl Van Doren's rebels. The Southern Spring, however, wore on the men of the Union Army, and by mid-April, many had begun to complain of the change in climate, weather, diet, and the continual rains and mud. Although the 17th Wisconsin had avoided the slaughter at Shiloh, the next few months wore heavily on the men. Halleck assumed command from Grant and consolidated his army at Pittsburgh Landing, where he was poised to move south with nearly 130,000 men. 
his focus was Corinth, Mississippi, where Beauregard and the remains of the Army of the Mississippi had retreated and linked forces with rebels under General Earl Van Doren. Corinth lay at the intersection of the Mobile and Ohio and Memphis and Charleston railroads. Control of these railroads would give Halleck's Army internal supply lines necessary to advance into the Mississippi Valley. Occupation of Corinth would give Halleck the option of moves towards either Vicksburg, which would open control of the Mississippi, or east towards Chattanooga, and thus threatening Atlanta. Despite his superior forces, however, Halleck's move on Corinth was painfully slow. Well, we are marching towards Corinth, Mississippi, but at a snail's pace, Westcott wrote his mother. Another soldier noted that he and the member of his regiments have gone to figuring how long it would take at our present rate to travel to reach any place. Six weeks, making less than 20 miles. The Union advance on Corinth in April and May suffered from the same overly cautious moves that delayed many Union moves during the first years of the war. According to Westcott, the men of the 17th traveled approximately a mile at a time, stopping to form a line of battle, stack arms, and build breastworks. The line of march, wrote another soldier, is marked by constant repetitions of breastworks. In those is the wisdom and foresight of General Halleck displayed. We don't intend to fall back, he continued, but if we do, there will be no bull run about it. Historian James McPherson has noted that Halleck waged war by the book, his book. The move on Corinth was an 18th century Jaminian war of maneuver and siege against a strategic point, not a modern war of all-out combat to destroy and cripple the enemy. It was a strategy that assured a string of defensive positions, which, though limiting the potential surprise attack, also limited any chance that Beauregard would route the men back to Pittsburgh Landing. It did, however, limit the Union from any freedom of movement and freedom of attack. Despite superior forces, it was evident, the New York Times concluded, that Halleck did not consider his defeat impossible nor even improbable. Otherwise, he would not be preparing to defend the roads after he advanced over them. Although Beauregard made no moves to stymie the Union advance, he was by no means idle. A lack of fresh water made Corinth ill-equipped to support a large army in siege. Dysentery and typhoid began to ravage southern troops, and Confederates lost as many troops to disease at Corinth as they had during the Battle of Shiloh. Soldiers and civilians alike, however, experienced a bloody battle at Corinth, and reports filtered north, which spoke of the growing concentration of Confederate troops in the city. As May progressed, these same newspapers reported contradictory news of evacuations and fortifications, as many at home eagerly awaited moves by either side that would lead to the hopeful capture and destruction of the rebel army. Recognizing his hopeless situation, Beauregard evacuated the city to the encroaching Federals and moved his men south in the hopes of reinforcing his army through the acquisition of smaller Confederate forces scattered throughout the region. Halleck's victory was thus bittersweet. Though the occupation of Corinth gave the North control over vital railroads that extended deep into southern territory, Beauregard had escaped again with his army nearly intact. The occupation of Corinth by Union troops yielded the truth about the size and strength of Beauregard's forts. The occupation of Corinth by Union troops yielded the truth about the actual size and strength of Beauregard's force. The realization that Confederate positions were weaker than previously supposed and could have been easily taken by assault brought, as one soldier noted, great mortification in our army. Ebenezer Westcott, the soldier we've been following since the beginning, was highly critical of Halleck's caution. I'm not so much a military man, he wrote his parents in June, but it seems to me the rebel army ought to have been driven out and half of them captured instead of being allowed to go away the way they did. With reinforcements, Westcott thought the Union Army must have had over 100,000 men, and if General Grant had been in command instead of General Halleck, I will bet that there would have been something doing about the Rebs would not have gone away, and they would not have got away so easy. As long as Halleck was in command, he concluded, I don't think we'll get hurt much by Rebel bullets, for I think the way we burrowed our way from Pittsburgh Landing to here, he is as much afraid of Rebel bullets as we are. Meanwhile, Braxton Bragg replaced Beauregard as commander of the Army of Tennessee and looked to break the Union momentum by pushing north back into Tennessee to relieve Chattanooga and threaten the federal position in Nashville. In support of his campaign, Confederates at Tupelo, Mississippi, under Sterling Price, moved in the southwest corner of Tennessee to join with Bragg. This move served to draw Grant from his defensive at Corinth, leaving the recently acquired city 
lightly defended. At Iuka on September 19th, Union forces checked Price's advance north and forced Confederates south to Ripley, Missouri, where they joined Earl Van Doren. The reorganized Confederate army, numbering nearly 22,000 men, left Ripley 10 days later on September 28th and moved northeast to Corinth with the hopes that a successful attack would be made upon the city from the west and the northwest, driving the Union forces back along the Tennessee River. These movements would ultimately lead to a clash in the field outside Corinth and would prove for the men of the 17th the first real opportunity to show their courage on the field of battle. The long siege of Corinth had in fact proved anticlimactic for many of the men in the 17th Wisconsin and they were itching for a fight. Their first real chance came on September 17th when Confederate guerrillas assaulted four co companies then tasked with defending the railroad east of Corinth. It was a small battle and the Civil War has largely been defined by its major pitch battles with many men and large casualties. But many soldiers, especially in the West, experienced the war more, more personally, fighting in small unit actions and skirmishes, such as the one that the 17th engaged in. Believing that the seemingly amicable terms that the men of the 17th were on with surrounding farmers and planters had lessened the, vigil the vigilance of the Wisconsin men, the guerrillas attacked. Amidst heavy firing from the regiment's pickets, the four companies in camp to a man sprang to their arms, and before the drummer had time to beat the long roll, they were drawn up in the line of battle, recalled one witness. Their colonel, James Doran, came down the line laughing, as in his want there was a chance to take the boys into action. Asked whether they were prepared to move to the front, the soldiers replied unanimously, Yes, colonel, already lead us on. Not a man shrunk from his duty, a newspaper at home reported, and the sick and wounded who had not done duty for two months turned out and shouldered their guns to a man. It was minor action, though, and it would be another two weeks before the entire regiment was truly tested against Confederate regulars. At 7.30 in the morning of October 3rd, General Earl Van Doren ordered his troops to advance against the Union line shielding Corinth in a large fortified position north of the city. The Confederate advance caused considerable confusion among the Union soldiers, and by 11 a.m., amid the rapid discharge of musketry and artillery, it had become pretty evident that our right was falling back. As one soldier from Wisconsin recalled, Davis's division did not come on our right as to reach the Memphis Road, and the rebels took advantage and easily gained the camps of our regiment and that of the 21st Missouri. The Union flank was left isolated from the rest of the army, and the men from Wisconsin's 17th Regiment found themselves on the far right of an isolated federal position. Doran, realizing that the advancing Confederates were attempting to flank their lines, ordered charge bayonet and forward march and led his men into the fray, advancing rapidly on four Mississippi regiments. This surprise charge drove the enemy back through the recently occupied camps. It was an Irish charge with all its accompaniments and rather astonished the enemy, I think, one newspaper reporter observed. Another noted that the, soldier of the, the soldiers of the 17th distinguished themselves from all other units in the fight, particularly in their bayonet charge, which was led by Doran. Other news outlets in the North reported the courageous acts of a slightly built 16-year-old private John Schwab of Company G, the French Mountaineers of, of Oconto County. During the battle, reported the company sergeant, Shop shot a rebel captain who was approaching him and bayoneted a lieutenant, killing them both. If the whole regiment had been as brave as that boy, a letter continued, our victory would have been much more decisive. Another member of the regiment, Sergeant Major Do John Nickel, was personally complimented by General MacArthur on the field of battle for brave conduct while leading skirmishers in battle. A well-known member of the First Ward of Milwaukee, Nickel was, quote, as fine-looking a soldier as ever left the state and does not know what fear is. On that day, the regiment suffered 40 killed, wounded, and missing as a result of their actions. And that evening, as they marched back through Corinth to their new position on the far right of the federal position, the men were loudly cheered by other regiments in their division for their decisive role in single-handedly driving the Mississippi Brigade from the field. It was a further testament to those back home of the heroic conduct of the men of the 17th Wisconsin. On October 4th, the Confederates resumed their attack. The fighting on the 3rd had severely weakened the Federal lines, and the attacking rebels successfully breached the Union center, turning their attention again on the length, left flank anchored by batteries Robinette and Phillips. It was in front of these fortifications that the heaviest fighting would take place. As the day progressed, the focus of the battle shifted, and the men of the 17th could plainly see the Confederates forming their lines directly in front of Fort Robinette, three or four hundred yards away on the edge of the timber. As one man recalled, they came soon four lines deep, and then our artillery opened, 
The infantry poured in their fire, and, the, and they actually planted their flag on the fort, but only for a few minutes. A brigade of our troops came in on the double quick on the charge, and a hand-to-hand -hand struggle made the enemy retreat, and the Battle of Corinth was over. Crossing over the field in pursuit of their, the fleeing rebels the next morning, the soldiers of the 17th were faced with the reality of battle for the first time. The slaughter of the rebels was terrible, wrote one soldier home. They lay in heaps of slain, waiting to be buried. While the men of Wisconsin relished in their victory, the larger picture of the war took an increasingly dark turn for the Confederacy. As the rebels retreated from Corinth, their hold on the West looked increasingly bleak. Union advances through Tennessee and Mississippi were complemented by larger dashes into the heartland of the Confederacy from the South as federal troops moved to occupy New Orleans, the South's largest city and biggest exporter of cotton. After that occupation, they began to move north up the Mississippi River towards Vicksburg. The Gibraltar of the West would fall the next year, and while it stood in defiance of northern control, the future was nevertheless bleak for the Confederates. In major battles, the Union forces had defeated their foes and all but broken Confederate resistance in the West. As large swaths of territory fell under Union control and Confederate civilians saw the might of Union armies, it became increasingly clear, at least to those on the ground, that the strength of the Confederate government to preserve its national boundaries and protect its people was faltering. At Shiloh and Corinth, Union forces emerged victorious, defeating the major rebel threats to the West, and though it would take three more years to secure this region, these victories were ultimately vital to the Union war effort. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.